Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our online workshop, Getting Back to School, the IAQ Factor, your roadmap for success to return to in-person learning. My name is Troy Raska, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Pure Air Control Services. And with me today, I have Frank Santini, who is our Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and Business Development. How are you doing, Frank? Good, Troy. Thank you for having me. Excellent. So uh, as you know, we're approaching the end of this school year very quickly, getting into spring break almost for many of those that are uh, still open. And so never before has this topic been more important than now, as you all are starting to plan during that spring break and for the upcoming summer uh, for any improvements that still yet need to be made before the new school year starts in the fall. So today's uh, presentation, we hope, will be a thought starter for some things maybe you haven't considered yet, or maybe a review for things that you've been undertaking uh, as you get ready to return to in-person learning. So today's agenda, uh, we're going to look at where we've been, where we are now, uh, what's going on with some of this CARES Act funding, and how to plan with that in mind, uh, and then the things that take up uh, making your school a healthy building. So establishing uh, a good baseline for indoor air quality, uh, sort of taking care of the things that really need to be addressed, uh, how to make your building a self-healing building, uh, and then staying out in front of it so that you don't have any other issues that arise, or if they do, you can address them very quickly. And then of course, we'll have time for questions and answers. So where have we been? We're coming up on one year of two weeks to flatten the curve. Uh, so I, I say that kind of jokingly, but we're one year into this pandemic now. And of course, uh, when it started, maybe the indoor environment or the indoor air quality of our schools, our universities, heck, even our office buildings, uh, wasn't a very high priority. Or in many cases, uh, you're putting out fires and only you know, barely fixing what's going wrong because you're un under a deferred maintenance budget or deferred maintenance program. And then this pandemic hits and it's a new virus, a novel virus. We, we didn't know what to expect. Uh, so there was many, many unknowns, both from a scientific perspective uh, and how it even spread, how it spread in a building. Uh, so with that, we had to operate with an abundance of caution. That two weeks to flatten the curve you know, quickly became social distancing, wearing masks, and of course, school closures. Uh, and all through this pandemic, right, uh, there's been varied levels of closure. Uh, some have opted to stay online only uh, with virtual learning. Some have a hybrid uh, learning program in place, uh, much like my own home state of Florida. So what, what happened was, is, is you saw very quickly the, uh, adoption of these new online platforms uh, to mixed results. And by now, one year in, uh, we're certainly doing better with it. And then, of course, minimal operations for your actual school facilities. So, you know, that kind of brings us to the present day and where we are now. Uh, and, you know, full disclosure, uh, I have two uh, daughters. One is a sophomore in high school and the other one is a freshman in college. So I'm starting to, to see the nuances between K through 12 and higher education and what's being done uh, on both campuses and certainly within uh, our own school district, Pinellas County Schools, uh, to address this pandemic. Of course, being in Florida, we very early returned to in-person learning last year, but the students and parents were given an option uh, to either choose virtual learning only or in-person learning uh, with the appropriate guidelines being addressed. Of course, uh, our school system uh, has given us uh, constant communication via email uh, over any sort of positive cases that arose in the schools and whether or not uh, our children were in contact with these uh, other students or teachers. So uh, in, in my mind, Pinellas County Schools has done a great job operating and navigating through this pandemic uh, and of course being partially open uh, as it is so now here we are we have more understanding 
uh, that includes better science. Uh, we have improved guidance, uh, not only from uh, the Centers for Disease Control, but for organizations like ASHRAE, uh, which help us understand the ventilation in buildings and the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, uh, and what to do during these uh, pandemic-type situations. So we have improved guidance. Of course, as I said, we have various levels of reopening. So that includes uh, new safety measures, uh, you know, and this this could be plexiglass shields, this could be face shields, of course, more hand washing, uh, you know, social distancing, masks, uh, you know, maybe new traffic flow patterns, obviously, right, in the schools. And so, so there's new safety measures in place. And then, again, we have this hybrid learning. I mean, some schools might be choosing to have in-person learning only a couple days of week and then the rest of the time online. Uh, again, schools like in, in my case, uh, your student chose to either be online only or in-person only. So uh, there's there's new methods of hybrid learning uh, that have been instituted. Of course, now we have the vaccines. So that is doing a lot to improve uh, the herd immunity for this uh, pandemic. And of course, instill a little more confidence in folks. But even with that, uh, as we see, you know, in the news, and uh, certainly you are all well aware, uh, there still seems to be low teacher confidence uh, to come back to in-person learning full time. Uh, and a lot of that is around the fact that they don't feel safe in their own building. And this has played out uh, not only with teachers, but office workers and, and, and other trades. In fact, Honeywell recently did a global study uh, that showed upwards to about 70% of uh, office workers were not confident that their building would be safe enough to return to. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today uh, is how to regain that confidence, how to ensure that level of safety, uh, to be able to uh, have your teachers come back, have your students come back, and have overwhelmingly the, the administrators and parents feel comfortable uh, with that situation as well. So I mentioned earlier, you know, before the pandemic, and, and, and Frank knows a little bit about this uh, too, he, he's in the field more than I am uh, working with our customers and such, but before the pandemic, many schools, especially K through 12 schools across the country, were operating under what we know as deferred maintenance. And there's been a lot of studies done on deferred maintenance. And so the reason that we're going to sort of touch upon this before we get in uh, to the rest of the content is that because some of these schools, some of your schools, uh, perhaps have already been at a deficit when it comes to the indoor environment or indoor air quality or your HVAC equipment. And then this pandemic just exacerbates that, uh, you know, to the point where now IAQ is a top of the mind priority. So, you know, Frank, why don't you tell us a little bit about deferred maintenance and, and how it relates uh, to your buildings and equipment? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I've had the pleasure of interacting with so many facility and maintenance managers in schools and colleges, hospitals, and, and all kinds of other kinds of facilities all over the country. And not everywhere, but, but the vast majority of places um, we're dealing with just the, uh, unfortunately, either a lack of a budget or a lack of manpower. And some really great people and really talented people doing the best they can, but um, you don't have the resources to to really get to the uh, preventative maintenance uh, that you need to get to, um, things will just go by the wayside. So as you can see here from the slide, um, there's been a number of pretty well-documented studies on the danger of that kind of um, uh, that kind of um, uh, action, but it is what it is in terms of how it, how it's ended up in terms of our our facilities. So you see there that you know one dollar in deferred maintenance um, can result in four dollars of of capital expenditures later on. Um, you know, Buildings.com study talked about future expenses being 15 times more than the initial repair if done correctly, of course. Um, and then the the NASA study is very interesting too, um, talking about shorter equipment life. So it's uh, it's something we see in all types of uh, verticals, uh, particularly in schools, but it's it's not just limited to schools. Um, and so that's part of what we want to cover here today is um, how we can integrate 
some of the solutions as we get back to school to helping this deferred maintenance problem. No, that, that's absolutely correct. So when we talk about budgets and, and then funds and planning, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is, is the CARES Act, which obviously was, again, passed almost a year ago, right? Uh, we're coming up on the anniversary and then refined and then even clarified a bit more in December of 2020. Of course, tomorrow they're voting on the second round of uh, relief uh, through the U.S. Congress. So it remains to be seen uh, what the breakout for schools is going to be from that legislation. But we do know a few things about this uh, funding source that has come through, and that's, of course, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act funding, right? And so a large chunk of that funding uh, has been referred to as the Education Stabilization Fund, or the ESF. And that saw almost $31 billion allocated, and this is the verbiage from the act, uh, to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. So very specifically for this pandemic, uh, which of course includes the safety of your buildings. And within that fund, there were two main points uh, that sort of address K through 12 and then K through 12 and higher ed or uh, institutions of higher education, IHE. And that is uh, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, or ESSER, and then the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, or GEAR. And of course, that uh, leaves some discretion up to the governors, being the leaders of their state, to know what's best in their state uh, for that funding. So uh, within that ESF, and this verbiage is coming from the Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance, or CFDA 84424, which is the ESF under the CARES Act. So this document was actually uh, circulated by the Department of Education. Uh, the one I have is dated December 2020. And in it, it sort of breaks down uh, these different uh, funding sources the rules and regulations of how you have to use them and account for them, and uh, of course, what they're available for. So we're not gonna uh, dive deeply into this, except to perhaps touch a little bit upon how it relates to buildings or the indoor environment or safety, environmental health and safety of your building. And so uh, I'll go ahead, Frank, and take the first one here. Uh, so in section uh, 18003D, and this is addressing the ESSER part of it. Uh, number five, the verbiage within uh, that chapter or paragraph uh, included to develop and implement procedures and systems to improve preparedness and response efforts as number five. And then number seven, uh, to purchase supplies to sanitize and clean the facilities. So this is some of the things we're gonna be talking about and some of uh, the areas that got affected maybe by deferred maintenance or lack of funds even before coronavirus. So, uh, and then in the governor's uh, emergency education relief, Frank, uh, what I, I guess you can just read what it says here, but maybe you can expound on it a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that the big takeaway um, for, for folks watching this is some you know, this, this webinar is open to the public, so some folks may already be, be well aware of what's out there, but there are a lot of clients we talk to who are not aware of the opportunities here. Um, the bottom line is through the CARES Act, which was passed last uh, last spring, that it, supplement uh, the CRRSA, which is passed just this past December, and potentially additional funding that, that they're working on right now in Congress, um, school districts will be able to apply uh, for what's called subgrants through their through the state, uh, which receive in turn money um, from these grant from these programs from the federal government, um, and the money should be apportioned in accordance with Title I uh, distributions. Um, so there's quite a bit of money coming coming to specifically devoted to schools. Um, some of that money will be able to be used for for things unrelated to the topic of this webinar. Uh, but there is, and I quote here, considerable flexibility in determining how best to use these funds in terms of trying to keep facilities safe, 
um, and around this co concept of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as it relates to this particular slide, in addition to uh, the funding that'll be available through you know, whatever your Department of Education is for whichever state you're in, there's also going to be a discretionary fund through the governor um, that the, the governor of each state will have some discretion as to apply some additional funds to schools as well. Um, and again, the, the, the language here is to continue to provide education services and support ongoing functionality of the LEA, which is uh, uh, just the acronym that the federal government and Department of Education uses for school districts, but also could mean charter schools um, and other school uh, on the other non-public schools as well. Although the details around um, if it's a non-public school, it gets a little bit more complicated beyond the scope of this particular presentation. But the, the takeaway here is <clears throat> if you're a school district uh, or a charter school or any kind of educational institution um, serving students, um, you, your team, your CFO, your comptroller, uh, your VP should be looking into applying for, uh, for grants through the state because the state is and is going to continue to receive federal funds that can be used towards uh, a lot of things we're going to be talking about today and towards other things that may benefit your institution. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And, and the final piece of this puzzle uh, that was, again, under the CARES Act, under the ESF, uh, referenced back to the Cash Management Improvement Act, and specifically Part 3, Section F, uh, which says that this ESF language, Prevent, Prepare, for and respond to coronavirus if, as long as what uh, you're doing with these funds relate to that then you can also uh, be able to get a grant through this program uh, so this was sort of green lighted through the cares act and and that section specifically uh, is uh, 200311 313 and then 439 and that's equipment real property management and so again uh, to quote that actual piece of legislation, it says funds can be used for capital expenditure of general and special purpose equipment, real property and construction for improvements to land buildings or equipment that meets the needs of the ESF. In other words, prevent, prepare for, or respond to coronavirus. So, uh, you know, the federal government uh, realizing these needs uh, has really you know, stepped up and is trying to address it and help you all uh, address these needs in your schools. So as we start to think about those funds, and again, as Frank said earlier, you know, many of you, uh, probably most of you have already uh, researched this, or again, uh, your CFO purchasing department, uh, you know, comptroller has researched this and is probably already using some of this funds. So uh, as we look towards the second round of funding that they're voting on tomorrow for this year. And we're moving ahead planning for, you know, hopefully a return to in-person learning for almost all the states uh, in the fall of 2021. You know, now you gotta start thinking about where uh, you need to put these funds, what you need to do uh, to make your school safe for that return to in-person learning. So, you know, what we talk about a lot here, being an environmental company, we've been around since 1985, so, uh, you know, COVID-19, this isn't our first pandemic. Uh, many of our procedures and things that we've developed over methods we've developed over the years uh, fit perfectly into uh, responding to this pandemic. So uh, we kind of refer to it as creating a holistic plan for building health. Don't just focus on one area or one piece of technology because there is no magic bullet uh, to creating a safe environment. It's a combination. Of things so and that absolutely starts with following the guidance right so the first cornerstone of your plan is going to be follow the guidance and that could be from your local uh you know school boards uh to your county uh administrators or the state right through the federal level right including the cdc or ashray um you know so again that is sort of the governing body uh for building systems that includes uh hvac uh, which we'll talk about in depth here in a couple slides. And so then what you're going to want to do is evaluate uh, your performance to date. So again, many of you have already undertaken many things, especially the schools that are already partially open or open, uh, such as elevated cleaning. You might have installed new technology. Uh, you might have already looked at uh, certain areas we're about to talk about. So, you know, we always 
say, go back, take a look at, at what you're doing and, and make sure it's, it's effective uh, and look for areas of improvement, right? So evaluate what you've done to date, you know, target this funding that we just talked about uh, and, you know, the procurement process. And so that includes the CARES and, uh, you know, the uh, ESF. And of course, if there's any cooperative contracts that you use. So uh, as, again, you know, this return to in-person learning might be sneaking up on you uh, and you might not have time to, to go to an open solicitation and, and take all the time to write it and review all of uh, the bids and questions and any kind of, you know, uh, contest that comes up against that. So uh, review your cooperative contracts. Uh, we have plenty of uh, cooperative purchasing opportunities through Pure Air Control Services. Uh, and so, you know, we encourage you to use those. Again, as I said, re review and improve completed items. So, you know, if, if you've already installed air purification or better filtration, what are you doing to ensure that it's actually working? Are you monitoring uh, whether or not your particles are going down or whether or not it's producing enough ions? And, and again, we'll get into this a little bit more, but, but you know, always uh, measure and make corrections uh, where needed, of course. And then, Anything you haven't addressed, uh, those should be on the to-do list as well. Like what else is there in our school that we can optimize uh, to make it safer for teachers, staff, and students? Uh, and that sort of really brings us to the uh, you know heavy lifting part of this content. But you know what does an optimized school look like? What does optimized indoor air quality look like? So you know we'll let this sink in. But these are sort of the key areas uh, that we're talking about when we talk about a holistic approach or a holistic plan uh, to the indoor environment. And uh, again, not only for schools, uh, we, we do this for hospitals and we have been doing this for hospitals through the pandemic, uh, as well as class A office buildings, hotels, resorts. You know, th this is really across the board what needs to be considered when you're looking at optimizing uh, your indoor environment. So. Of course, you know, that all starts with understanding uh, what uh, your building looks like at a given snapshot in time. And so you, you have to sort of understand where you're at to be able to get where you want to go. Uh, and, and so we refer to this as establishing the baseline or establishing or testing your baseline indoor air quality. And so without getting too far into the weeds, you know, we like to make the analogy that the HVAC system, uh, your heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system, and we realize there's schools in the north that might not have a modern central HVAC system. So even up to and including the way the building itself works, the hallways, opening windows, uh, creating airflow through the building, but the HVAC system is like the lungs of a building. It takes a breath for the building uh, four to five times an hour. And of course, with this ASHRAE guidance, you know, they're saying to open uh, the outside air and let it in more. And they're calling for higher air change rates, maybe as much as eight times an hour. Uh, so if you think of it as taking a breath, getting rid of all the old air inside of the classroom and the hallway and the auditorium, and then bringing new air in, a combination of outside and recirculated filtered air, that's why HVAC is critical uh, to the indoor environment. And anything that's wrong within the HVAC system, right, could drastically affect the indoor environment. So Frank, tell us a little bit about what this HVAC hygiene assessment or being able to address the HVAC system looks like. Yeah, you know, I think it's important too to think about this like from a overview perspective for the audience listening here. You know, you wanna try to avoid the mentality um, that unfortunately some folks have where they just want to get the coronavirus problem off their plate or you know, just do one thing or buy one thing, whether it's a MERV 13 filter or increasing the outside air or, or whatever, whatever the case may be, and just say, okay, I took care of you know the, the building. Uh, not to say those things may not be a good thing to do, just that you should think of it as an overall holistic problem. Um, you know, part of it relates to the fact that, unfortunately, there's a lot of psycho psychology to this as well, and you have to just be be aware that, um, you know, when folks are complaining about the air quality in the building, 
uh, while there is a lot of psychology to it, there's a lot of science to it as well. And so thinking about this from the perspective of instead of just trying to get that one product or that one magical solution, step back, understand what is going on inside your building. You don't go to the doctor and immediately get surgery. You go to the doctor to get diagnosed and establish what your actual condition is going on inside your body so the doctor can make an informed decision about what's going to help your particular body. Similarly, for an HVAC system and the next slide, which is the overall building, when you look at an HVAC hygiene assessment or an overall what we call building health check, we're trying to get an understanding of what's going on inside the building and what may be able to be helpful going forward, not just for a short-term coronavirus solution, but in general to improve the building health, improve the indoor quality, improve the cleanliness, quite frankly, of what's going on inside your air handlers and air ducts, which if you have those in your building, you may not realize the condition uh, because of deferred maintenance. Um, and also help you make informed decisions about capital planning going forward uh, because of that deferred maintenance and some of the older equipment you may have. So that, that's a good way to think about this as, as we go forward, taking that step back um, and not just making a, a, you know, a rash decision as to just getting the, the quote unquote COVID-19 funding issue or COVID-19 problem off your plate and stepping back and understanding what can we really do that's not only going to help us in the short term, but also help us moving forward in the long term to, to do a great job of keeping the building healthy, uh, helping improve the efficiency of the building, um, and also you know, improve the attitudes and comfort of the folks who have to be there every day. Now, that's well said, Frank. It, it really does sort of set the stage as to why this sort of one-two punch with uh, assessing your HVAC system and then making a larger building assessment is so important uh, as a foundational step uh, because one, you're collecting data, uh, you'll have a report generated as to what exactly is going on, so it will literally give you a roadmap on things to correct and corrective action to take to bring the health of the building in line and again, establish that good baseline. So you know, an HVAC hygiene assessment does just that. It will help prioritize the maintenance of the systems, whether you need to restore them or replace them. As Frank said, it's gonna optimize the indoor air quality, the comfort, uh, hopefully reduce particles and such, and then actually make the system more energy efficient because we'll look at that as well. So, you know, we're gonna look at the visual condition. We're gonna take uh, environmental samples from these air conditioning units and, and perhaps the ductwork. We'll look at airflow and energy testing, as I said, duct leakage, uh, which can lead to, you know, infiltration, uh, you know, bringing in particles from outside of the controlled or filtered system, right? And we're going to look at the pressurization and tightness. When we move to the building, and that's what we call a building health check, uh, it, you know, it's a comprehensive field and lab analysis to look at what the conditions and the performance of your building, your school building is actually doing right so we're going to look for contaminants and and not only uh you know look if they're present we're going to try to find where they're coming from what kind of risk they pose so how much load uh is in the environment of, of these contaminants and what risk it poses and these could be anything from uh, allergens uh, as we know which, which cause a lot of problems in school you know when it's not a pandemic right with allergy attacks and asthma attacks that create school absence uh, and distraction uh, to bacteria. You know, buildings have been shut down uh, for you know a, a pretty significant period of time. Uh, water hasn't been flowing uh, as regularly through these systems, uh, and Legionella is a bacteria which creates another kind of respiratory disease, Legionnaires' disease. And so we can certainly, you know, we'll take a look at the water and, and test for uh, Legionella bacteria and other kinds of bacteria. Of course, mold and then viruses. We can test the environment for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And, and we have a, a very direct and, and pretty simple test to take off of surfaces, uh, which we use PCR technology uh, to look at, the very same PCR or molecular technology to determine the presence of the virus. Or we could do a more uh, investigative study and, and take bioaerosol samples within a building. Uh, to see whether or not there's the presence of the virus uh, in the air. So uh, we have options there. Of course, we look for floor and wall moisture, which 
that can lead to bacteria and mold issues, right? We look to make sure the HVAC system is maintaining a good temperature and humidity balance because both of those affect how this virus can spread and, and other viruses can spread through the indoor environment. And then we'll look at uh, how the envelope or how the, 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 the building itself is performing. Uh, you know, is, is it under negative pressure or too much negative pressure or too much positive pressure? Is it bringing in pollution from the outdoors? So once we take a look at all of this, or you would have this done for you, you would have a, a very detailed report and it would literally give you recommendations on, on the deficiencies that were found to be able to fix uh, any of these issues. So, you know, we'd like to call that a prescriptive approach to indoor air quality. You know, if, if you went to your doctor, uh, you and the doctor didn't do anything. They just kind of looked at you and said, you know what, I think you need your appendix out. I'm going to go ahead and schedule that surgery. I mean, you wouldn't do that, right? You know, you, in fact, it would be malpractice without having the proper diagnostics done and, and to then be able to prescribe whatever that remedy is. So that's, if you think of it in that terms, th these are the baseline diagnostics you need to start to create that healthy building and start to, you know, take care of business, right? I use the little Elvis thing, taking care of business. But, but no, what, what does that involve? You know, when we, when we look at the bigger picture of what this holistic approach looks like, you know, it's going to start with that IAQ baseline being evaluated, and then we're going to probably get right into the HVAC system and take a look at it. And so, you know, one of our foundational services that we've been offering for many, many years now, uh, and it's a proprietary, uh, you could single source it service, is called Pure Steam, and it's a thorough, deep sanitization uh, that's high temperature and low pressure steam. And we, we use some bioenzyme treatments before and after. Uh, the service on the coil uh, to ensure cleanliness and, and extended cleanliness. And, and, you know, what this is going to do over just sort of a tertiary cleaning uh, where you might take some uh, chemical detergent and, and foam it up and spray off the coils is this is going to penetrate deep through the coils. It's going to get a lot of debris out uh, and it's going to increase the overall performance and hygiene of these units. And so uh, again, we're not gonna go into this blind. We're gonna do some testing before we even start cleaning it to see what areas of the coil is most fouled. And then we're gonna set to task to work and start steaming away until we get good airflow throughout the coil. Uh, and of course, as we know, ASHRAE, this governing body for uh, HVAC, has said that ventilation has to be increased. Airflow is a must. So if you're, uh, evaporator coils or reheat coils inside of an air handling unit are fouled or clogged up, that's going to reduce airflow going through the whole system. And it could set the building controls off and, and put them uh, out of alignment and, and a whole host of other problems. So this, this is sort of foundational to the HVAC system once uh, you have it assessed is to get in there and deep clean it. And then you know, this probably needs to happen about once a year. Uh, you know, fouling can build up and return over time. Uh, and certainly if you've never had these uh, coils cleaned, you know, it could take a little bit longer at the beginning, but then plus one year, it's gonna go a little quicker. Uh, but what this all does is it reduces, you know, your normal work orders. As you saw with that deferred maintenance uh, from the NASA study that said, if you don't do anything to your equipment, you're gonna have a 30% failure rate sooner. Right, so it's gonna it's gonna reduce work orders overall, and it's gonna extend the equipment life. So we we've gotten thousands and thousands of coils, hundreds of thousands of coils, probably uh, since the beginning that we've worked on and done, and, and we see these results time and time again. And of course, just like the environmental reporting, once your HVAC system is cleaned, you are gonna get a full report with pictures. Uh, with a job log, uh, any kind of environmental data that we, you know, collected maybe for that uh, particular unit, uh, and you'll have it all, uh, you know, in a bound report or, or a PDF report. So you'll have it for future service records to show what you're doing uh, for your system. And then to really take it to the next level, we offer a restoration process uh, of the total a air handler unit or AHU. And uh, Frank, why don't you take us through this a little bit? 
Yeah, sure. So, you know, we're thinking about this process and, and, and how we can take advantage of trying to take, you know, lessen the impact of deferred maintenance over the years. One way is through the, the steam process that we just talked about for getting a deep clean of your air handlers and your coils. Uh, but you can also take that a step further because you're thinking about, okay, how can I perhaps extend the life of my existing um, air handling equipment? Um, they don't always have to be replaced after a certain amount of time. And you'd be surprised how many can be sustained uh, through some pretty straightforward processes that we discuss here in this in this slide. Uh, taking the, the pure steam process that we just discussed and also combining that with use of very specialized coatings. And I'm not talking about a type of coating that you would buy at Home Depot or, or Lowe's, uh, but the very specialized coatings that are, are designed and meant to withstand the pretty uh, intense and harsh environments that you see within air, air handling systems and um, on the exterior sides of rooftops on the air handling systems where that are getting beat, beat down by the sun or the weather conditions all the time and are corroding the, the environment, uh, the, the equipment itself. So these coatings are designed and go through an intense certification process, uh, various temperatures, various acidic and and salt environments to, to make sure they can withstand and really help sustain the this uh, equipment at the end of the day. We're talking about metal boxes here. If it, you know, assuming the coil's in good shape and assuming that your motor and blower are going, let's sustain that equipment so you can get more uh, useful life out of it. Then you have the benefit also, uh, these, these coatings have been developed with antimicrobial and antiviral properties. So you have the benefit of being able to to show your constituents um, in your for your institution that hey not only are we um, helping sustain and save capital expenditures by helping keep these units going for a while but also this is these are antiviral properties and they've actually been tested on the on the COVID-19 virus surrogate uh, to show to show inhibition of, of that particular virus so very very exciting stuff when it comes to uh, what what, the, what this can accomplish for um, not only as it relates to COVID, but in general, helping to, you know, help uh, facilities plan and uh, and keep their equipment going for a long period of time. The other piece rec uh, mentioned here in this slide is insulation. You know, we all, I'm sure, have seen from time to time, whether it's in your own uh, facility or other places, where you have these single-walled fan coil units or air handlers or, or rooftop units that have exposed fiber liner in, in the inside of the air handler. Um, and this is a notorious um, concern with respect to mold and bacterial growth because the fiber, the fiberglass liner can you know, allow, allow constituents to get inside of it and, and grow. And so replacing that with a closed cell material um, is very important in, in terms of making it more hygienic within the air handler and helping, again, extend the life because it, uh, our, our pure cell is, uh, has been lasting for years and years. We've done units where We've cleaned the units and had the pure cell in there 20 years later, it's still in great shape. Um, and then the last piece that's referred here in this particular slide is the concept of potential uh, motor retrofits or fan retrofits within the air handler. So taking your old belt driven blower system, potentially retrofitting it uh, with a fan or wet, fan array or fan wall, depending on the, the size and, and, um, and consideration of the way the unit is set up. So all those things considered, you can, you can potentially look at a, uh, refurbishment of an air handler for 20 to 40 percent of the cost of new while at the same time providing some peace of mind um, uh, to, to the constituents within your school or, or institution that you have antiviral coatings inside your air handlers as another uh, thing to tout about how you're keeping the building safe. You know that, that's an excellent point uh, and, and again referencing back to that CARES Act funding and the ESF I mean this is falls squarely uh, in the range of equipment, uh, equipment restoration, or recapitalizing a piece of equipment. Uh, and of course, these coatings uh, come with a five-year warranty. Uh, and we also have a workmanship warranty here at uh, Pure Air Control Services. So this kind of just takes you through the process. As I said, there's a handout in the handout tray that actually goes into great detail about uh, one of the units we did for Pinellas County Schools at a K through 12 school rooftop unit. But as you can see here in this slide, uh, there's actually some microbial growth uh, growing here uh, where 
the metal meets on the outside of this unit. This unit is in a mechanical room, so you can kind of very clearly see the before and after effects of this antimicrobial pure coat coating, as we call it. Uh, and then this is what an exterior unit might look like. And this one, you know, if you look at, at the before picture, it's not in terrible shape, but uh, it's been baked in the sun and it's kind of getting chalky and rusty and there might be some infiltration there. Uh, and so to be able to coat these with, you know, high performance coating, water resistant, UV resistant, it's been tested in the Arctic and it's been tested in extreme heat and sea salt. Uh, even on like oil rigs, uh, these things will hold up and will definitely increase the lifespan of the equipment. Uh, again, same with the drain pans. And Frank, as you know, and, and you've been on a lot of site visits, these drain pans are notorious for harboring uh, microbials. If, if they get standing water in them as they begin to rust. Uh, and so, you know, it's almost crucial that these get cleaned up, scraped up. Uh, what we do is we use garnet. Uh, not sand, but garnet, and we garnet blast them and get it down to the bare metal and then prime it and refinish it with these high performance coatings. In this case, our pure coat and then our pure liner, which is the blue pan liner that you saw in the opening slide. And then, you know, Frank, you can kind of talk a little bit about this, but suffice to say, as Frank was talking about this insulation replacement a little bit earlier, if you look at this picture, uh, you know, on the before side, uh, that is fiberglass, exposed fiberglass insulation that is just teeming with microbiological growth and, and mold mold growth. And this is basically on the fan side and it'll be blown through and into the coil. Uh, and so this is a before and after. We took this entire fan out and replaced it with uh, what Frank was calling a fan wall earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as you see here, you know, now we have a five, uh, array or fan wall system that took the place of the blower and again the, you, depending on who the audience here is you'll, you may only have some air handlers that are eligible for this kind of full retrofit but just to educate the audience and make them aware of what's out there what can be done with your existing equipment remember as we're sitting here and thinking about this again I'll emphasize that the quote considerable flexibility to be able to use these funds to help better your school and make the building a better place to, to live and work. So a lot of opportunity here uh, to, to uh, use your stimulus funds to be able to help um, increase, in this case, not only increase the, the, the indoor air quality by removing the, the old insulation, as you see here in this photograph, but also by, not, by now having redundancy in multiple fans, you're better in the ventilation. Uh, so you have, a, you have uh, which is obviously, a, everybody knows that at this point, better ventilation um, in a particular area is, is well, re well regarded to help uh, prevent the transmission of COVID. So a lot of opportunity here to look at what can be done um, to really improve uh, with this opportunity to, to, to inject funds in the system and help uh, allay these deferred maintenance problems that have accrued over the years in a particular school or school system. No, you're absolutely right. And, and another thing to be thinking about as we're moving through this deck uh, is that th these are all plug and play. So we realize that a lot of schools out there are, are working already in these areas or, or some of our uh, mechanical contracting partners that are on the workshop today have already addressed some of these key areas, uh, but we're presenting them just to show, again, that, that it takes a holistic approach to do that. So once uh, you, know, you address the actual air handling units and supply and return plenums that, that uh, are hooked up to them, then it's time to take a look at that ductwork and what what could be in that ductwork or has built up over time that could affect the overall health of the building, right? And so we have developed a very high level uh, of duct cleaning. So we're, we're not just going in with some roto brushes and a shop vac and cleaning these ducts out. No, 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 we're gonna go in and set up containment. We're gonna take particle readings to make sure we're not doing any kind of cross-contamination. And we're going to go in and we're going to work it 20 feet at a time. If we have to cut access doors, we are mechanically licensed. So we can actually alter the ductwork or repair it uh, rather than just stick a brush and a vacuum in it and clean it. So these are mechanically engineered methods uh, for the total air conveyance system. And so that includes uh, VAV uh, boxes, which are like booster fan boxes that help again in that ventilation right? Uh, any kind of dampers or turning vanes, 
reheat coils or terminal boxes. And so what our process does is it absolutely reduces bacteria and mold, uh, dust and particulates, which is the big concern here uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 being airborne and getting into the ductwork. It can cluster with other particulates uh, and, and move through there. It's gonna improve your airflow and ventilation. Again, getting rid of this dust and particulates gonna minimize uh, allergies and asthma attacks. And with all of our services, uh, you're going to get a full comprehensive report that shows just what we did, including before and after pictures, uh, where, you know, the location that they were taken and where we cleaned and what we did. And of course, uh, all of uh, our crews, our, uh, you know, lead men and, and women in, in the field that are working, the technicians are have the proper certifications to be working on the equipment and with the equipment uh, that they're handling, of course. So here's you know, just some before and after results. Uh, you know, this is just, you know, straight metal ductwork, uh, you know, with a couple drops, it looks like going down. And you can see how dusty it actually gets, you know, and for so for us to come in here, contain it with negative pressure and a HEPA air filter uh, and get it clean. So that, that's one instance. Another instance would be that a lot of duct cleaning companies, standalone duct cleaning companies that don't have an environmental background, aren't gonna address equipment that's placed within the ductwork. And so in, in this case, this was an actual job that we had come in behind another duct cleaning company uh, that actually made conditions worse after they cleaned it because uh, one of these filters that was in uh, the unit had disintegrated and clogged up this reheat coil and basically choked off all the airflow uh, to the room that it was servicing. And so the entire environment of the room that it was servicing got hot, it got humid, mold began to grow, they didn't know what was going on, and we came out and did an assessment and found these conditions and were able to clean it up. And then of course, much like the new life process that Frank uh, was taking you through earlier and we talked about, uh, we also have encapsulating paint that we can use that once we clean uh, this duct board or fiber board, some, so some ducts uh, are made, of this board and not metal. And it's basically a fiberglass insulated duct board. And so it, over time, it can break down. These fine fiberglass fire, uh, fi uh, fibers can be distributed through the air and you could actually breathe them in and it could cause irritation uh, or allergy attacks. So we can come in and once we clean it, encapsulate it to make sure uh, that it's not degrading or spreading those fibers throughout the building. Uh, another, thing that we do, but that we also know that most schools are already doing or have a plan in place to do is full decontamination or disinfection of a building. And so, uh, you know, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but know that we offer a five tier uh, program uh, to do building decontamination. And that's based on your project need. We can do what your custodial crews are doing right now and do a very thorough wipe down with uh, list end disinfectants uh, and do it at a very high level, or we can come in and spray with electrostatic sprayers. We can actually get into uh, the ductwork or even the air handler units with this disinfection uh, for an extra layer of uh, assurance beyond like the steam cleaning uh, and be able to, we have certain uh, disinfectants that are rated to be able to be used inside of the ductwork. In other words, they create a dry mist. They're not gonna put moisture in the ductwork because we, we don't want that, obviously. Um, and so again, with our services, above and beyond a normal custodial or housekeeping service, uh, every time we do a pure decon job, we're, you're gonna get a report uh, and, and have a certification that this service was performed. You know, we see even through COVID-19 that um, exterminators have gotten into the disinfection game. Uh, you know, people that would normally come out and spray for bugs are now, you know, addressing the environment in some way, uh, you know, and, and they probably don't even know the nuances within the environment and what they need to do for something like a virus as serious as COVID. So that brings us to, you know, almost near our conclusion now. So thank you for hanging in there with us. We're, we're almost done and we'll, we'll answer uh, any more questions as we get there. But we wanna talk about this concept of self-healing buildings. And Frank, you know, I know that 
uh, you, you talk to schools and, and facility managers day in and day out, and there's been a lot of talk, there's been a lot of um, integration already done with certain air purification and air cleaning technologies, uh, bipolar ionization, air purifying units, uh, UV, right? And so before we get into the section uh, about creating self-healing buildings and, and some of the, the products we offer through our Healthy School Building Program, I, I wanted to spend a second and talk uh, about our environmental diagnostics laboratory. So one of the divisions of Pure Air Control Services is Environmental Diagnostics Laboratory, and there are full services uh, accredited, A2LA accredited, CDC elite uh, laboratory. And as part of that laboratory, and of course, this is the laboratory that's going to support our building investigations, our HVAC hygiene assessments. They're going to be looking at the samples, providing the analysis and reporting on the microbiological side. Well, this laboratory also has one of the few commercial environmental test chambers uh, in the country. So when we start to talk about air cleaning products and air cleaning technology, uh, over the years, even before the pandemic, we've assessed uh, you know, just about every single air purifier, uh, type of air purifier, right? Uh, needlepoint bipolar ionization, UV lights, um, different kinds of HEPA filtration units uh, over the years in this test chamber. Uh, you know, and again, this is a commercial endeavor, so we have companies coming to us to test their products uh, for efficacy before they put them out into the marketplace. So we have a wealth of data uh, on the varying degrees that this technology works. And, and, you know, most of it does a good job and it works, but it's also influenced uh, the decision for the products we've decided uh, to move forward with manufacturing uh, and or reselling uh, as far as putting sort of our seal of approval on them for knowing that they actually work and work at a very high level. So, you know, that being said, uh, this, this is a, a tremendous asset to us and you if we come alongside in a consultative role to know that any technology we're going to put out into your school has been tested in this test chamber, uh, which can simulate a variety of indoor conditions. It can be inoculated with a variety of contaminants. Uh, so it can, we can increase the particle load and see how well it cleans it out. We can do different surrogates or different kinds of bacteria, mold, uh, VOCs. So it's, it's really provided a lot of data for us to build upon when we start looking at these technologies and putting them uh, into place, into play. So uh, obviously there's two sort of ways we can look at uh, creating what we call a self-healing building. So, you know, once the baseline is established, once all of the equipment is, is clean and, and functioning uh, as designed or exceeding uh, what like ASHRAE is recommending to do, you know, now we can look at maintaining that environment or creating a self-healing building with these kind of air cleaning technologies. So there's a systemic approach, a technology that works within this HVAC system, and then there's what's called a localized approach or an approach that works actually inside of the room or inside of the building. So when we look at the systemic side, uh, you know, we're looking at these products and, and they, they've really taken the market by storm right now. And again, to varying degrees of efficacy, but it's uh, this technology called bipolar ionization. And so essentially, uh, there's different kinds of equipment based on the kind of equipment it's going to be installed in. Uh, and there's various ways that it can operate. It can hook into your control system. It can come on and off with the air handler unit. It can just stay on all the time. So uh, we don't need to get too far into the weeds here, but just know that there's lots of options available depending on your equipment or situation. But what this does is that it, cre it creates millions and millions of positively and negatively charged ions. And these ions travel through the air, which is where SARS-CoV-2 is, right? And at the molecular level, they're always looking to find their equal opposite or another molecule that they can, they can interact with to be able to, uh, you know, form their new molecule that they're trying to do, you know, that's real basic chemistry stuff, right? Uh, but 
anyway, so what they do is, is in this case, you can see the sort of four main pillars of how bipolar works in the environment. And one specifically for the virus or bacteria, uh, you know, or an organism, a micro a biological organism, as the organisms are trying to divide and reproduce, these ions are going to come alongside of them and take the hydrogen off of the viral cell and effectively inactivate it. And at the very basic level, that's how it's working. There's been numerous studies uh, on this and on the efficacy of this. Uh, again, with the use of chemicals, higher use of chemicals for cleaning the building, it's gonna do a very similar process to be able to uh, break down uh, the molecular structure of, of these chemical odors and the chemicals that are floating uh, in the air. The same with gases or smoke, uh, it's gonna do the same thing. And then lastly, uh, which is also huge, is it's gonna cause any of these sort of, um, uh, you know, non-organic or, or just these particles, these dust particles, fiberglass particles, human skin cell flakes, right? The, the dust and the particles in the air, it's gonna cause them to cluster and form bigger clusters of particulate that are then more easily captured in the filter. So uh, this is basically how bipolar ionization works. And I know some of you may already have it installed. Some of you are still considering it, but don't even know what it is. So we hope maybe this clears a few things up for you on how it works and how effective it works. You know, one thing to mention uh, here, Frank, is that the, the units for the bipolar ionizers uh, unlike UV light, you know, they, they don't really have uh, a bulb that's going to go, uh, that's going to burn out eventually. Uh, they don't take as much energy consumption to, to produce these ions. You know, some of these devices are very small. This number two device that, that's on here is, is probably a little smaller than an iPhone. So they're, you know, a lot of ions out of a little package, but uh, you know we, we find that they're very effective, uh, relatively low to no maintenance at all. So after and, we take care of the system, oh, and Troy, let me just mention one thing. This, you yeah, know, thinking about again this holistically, um, we've had many many clients looking at doing a combined um, uh, execution of a project in which they're looking to install. Uh, this pure plasma or bipolar ionization, um, and they want to get their ventilation system cleaned prior to installation of whatever self-cleaning device they're going to put in, whether it's uh, pure plasma, some other bipolar ionization, or even UV light sometimes. So just as you think about what can I, what can I utilize my funds for from the CARES Act and the supplement to the CARES Act, uh, you know, executing uh, air handler cleaning, duct cleaning, installation of self-cleaning uh, technology like pure plasma um, is a great way to to do that as part of a, your plan um, and also to provide ongoing benefits going forward. That's a great point, Frank. So that, that brings us to the in-room solution, which uh, again has, has been extremely popular and, and we've been working with a lot of schools uh, to date through the pandemic, uh, helping them choose the right kind of in-room air purification device and where to place it. Uh, and, you know, cause it's not, again, it's not a one size fits all proposition. Uh, you're looking for a device that's going to operate within the set amount of cubic feet in a room or square feet in a room. And so, and then again, there's a lot of consumer level devices that are you know made for a small living room or a bedroom and we've seen sometimes schools going uh you know the inexpensive route just to get something right but it's it's not effective at all for what they're trying to have it do so uh, again looking at this from a holistic or an environmental approach you want to be able to choose the right device to get uh the most bang for your buck as far as cleaning uh, in these rooms. So, uh, we, you know, we've partnered with fellows, Aramax Professional. We offer a, a well-rounded program with them uh, that can even include uh, servicing the units with filter changes. Uh, so that would be one less thing that your facilities team would have to do when the time comes. But uh, these are professional grade wall mounted or there, there's a stand option that you can uh, use to move around a room. 
uh, air purifiers that offer a multi-stage filter system. They have three sizes depending on the square feet. It is true HEPA. It has its own bipolar ionizer. And then it has what's called EnviroSmart technology. It senses the occupancy of the room and will turn on and off or increase fan speed or decrease fan speed depending on occupancy, not only for energy efficiency, but also uh, to do a more effective job. Uh, and, then it and then it also includes peer view technology that actually shows you the particle load of the room uh, and how clean the room is. And of course, when your filter needs to be changed. And it also has very quiet operation. So this is basically how it works. It's a three-stage filter. It has a pre-filter, a carbon filter, uh, and then the HEPA filter that has antimicrobial, antiviral coating on it. And so it brings all of the constituents in the room through the unit and then out through the top where the bipolar ionizer is. So you would be getting, if, if let's say you already have bipolar ionization in your system, uh, your system is being cleaned, it's coming through into the room and then this continues to clean the room uh, you know, where you're at. So it's, it's really a, a great device that they're not uh, very expensive at all considering what type of device it is. Uh, and again, we've helped many schools uh, with this technology. And again, we tested this te technology before we decided to partner with Aramax and bring it to market. And so- Yeah, Troy, I'll say a few things here. Yeah. The, uh, you know, the teachers love this device and uh, I'm cognizant probably some of the audience here has already dealt with um, just a flood of wannabes out there in the market and, and the temptation to go after the, the cheap quote unquote HEPA air purifier on Amazon or whatever the case may be is, that, maybe is there, uh, particularly if you have a lot of classrooms. We get it, you know, if you have a lot of classrooms, it's, it gets to be um, a hefty price to, to outfit all your classrooms with an air purifier. Uh, but but take a step back as you're going through and thinking about this, because um, when you have a device like this that has not only, not a HEPA, a true HEPA filter, which is a big difference, because we're talking about the difference between two microns, which in the virus world is huge, versus 0.1 or 0.3 microns, which is what a, a true HEPA filter uh, filters out. So that's a big difference when you're, you're, you see some of the cheap competitors out there that are trying to uh, pull the wool over your eyes. Another, another issue too is the visibility of this device. You, uh, you know, when a teacher can walk in the classroom and see what her, what's called PM 2.5 is, which is a particular level of particles in the air that is very indicative of the indoor quality, measuring that, uh, measuring the levels of VOCs uh, and actually seeing it and showing it right there as a percentage on the on the device, uh, like an LED, uh, like an iPad screen, you can see that kind of visibility combined with the fact that you can wall mount it, um, which you know you know prevents it from being used as a doorstop eventually. So it's it's there and can do its job. Um, really has has shown this to be you know an extremely valuable device for many schools across the country. And so be very discerning about your, your choice of, of, of in-room air filtration uh, because this is, a, you know, this is an excellent product that can really uh, make a difference for, for a permanent investment into the classroom. Um, Troy, I know we're coming up on the, on the last year. Oh, yeah, cover IQ guard real quick, Troy, and I'll, and I'll, I'll sum it up. Yeah, no, no, exactly. So, so really, once you've done all of this uh, work in the school, you've established that great baseline, the equipment's clean, now you're chugging along, self-healing your school buildings, uh, what do you do to stay out in front of it? Because, you know, you're, you're not going to have us, you know, come out every week and keep testing your building, right? Uh, that, that would be very cost prohibitive. Um, so we have a solution in place that's called IQ Guard. And it's a series of nodes with uh, built-in sensors that are placed throughout the building that basically log the conditions of the building 24 seven and sends them into the cloud. And then your facilities team or administrators uh, or someone from our team can log on and check uh, the conditions at any time that they want. Of course, parameters can be set up to send alerts if any one of these conditions start to to trend down into the negative for an extended period of time. Uh, and these alerts can be sent via text or email. And then of course, uh, you're gonna be able to generate reports. 
And so you can have it automatically generate a report every week and send it to the appropriate stakeholders. And it's just gonna be a background function and it'll, it'll do it week in and week out. Uh, or you can go in and custom make reports uh, to look at it by quarter. You know, or what was the school building doing over the summer with low occupancy versus what is it doing when we're at full occupancy? You know, basically anything that you can imagine to slice and dice the data, it, it's gonna be able to do. So it's a really cool uh, you know, platform to use to stay out in front of what these baseline conditions are and anticipate problems and have that insight and visibility. And it, you know, again, I think I covered most of it, but really what it's gonna monitor here is your temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, uh, particulate matter, which is uh, Frank talked about a little bit earlier, uh, and total volatile organic compounds. Now, it's gonna monitor all three sizes of particulates. So, uh, you know, 0.03, which is, you know, the very, very small respirable size particulate, uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10. So those are, those are all good indicators of how well are your air filters doing if you've increased to MERV or HEPA filters, how well are these air purifiers doing? Maybe it's, it's an early warning sign that the filters in those need to be changed if the particle load is higher, right? CO2 is a good uh, constituent for tracking ventilation. So, you know, we've installed these devices, you know, across hundreds of buildings and we can look and actually see when the building's occupied because CO2 goes up. And then at five o'clock in the office building or 6.30 or seven, if we see the graph go down and it's downtrending because the building's not occupied. We've installed these in hospitals near a surgical suite where we could see when doctors and their staff were scrubbing in or scrubbing out of surgery because the volatile organic compounds would rise to an unacceptable level and then immediately dissipate. So it's, it's a very cool tool uh, to be able to stay out in front of it. And it, it's kind of a subscription-based thing so we would come in, we would do all of the setup for you, and then there would be a, a sort of monthly fee to keep this cloud uh, and reporting system going. Uh, but again, it's relatively inexpensive, and uh, it can operate right over the school's Wi-Fi or uh, for folks that have very secure networks or don't want this tying into their local area network, we can also provide an option with its own cellular router and cellular account to take it up to the cloud. So a uh, really neat feature. Uh, a lot of schools might even have this right at their front desk with, with the check-in in the morning uh, to show that, that the conditions are all in, in favorable or good standing. So uh, a really, really cool tool. A lot of people are jumping on board. And, and what we liked about this is, is the integration and uh, the ease of use of it, and as well as the reporting functions. And then, you know, we always want to close on a high note and, and we thank all of you for sticking around. And I've done a pretty good job of answering your questions along the way, but we'll still have some time for questions here. But this is just one uh, school success story uh, up in the Philadelphia area of Pennsylvania. And, and Frank, you want to maybe talk to this real quick? Yeah, th this is referring directly to the Aramax um, air cleaning, air purifying units we just referred to earlier, the, the wall mounts. Um, and uh, how happy this particular uh, uh, school was uh, because let's think about why are they happy because they made their constituents happy their teachers and the parents and the students you know because you're thinking about as a facilities professional or principal or operations professional you're trying to get your constituents to feel more comfortable but do it in a real way actually do some things that are making them feel comfortable and that's actually working so challenge your administrators as you leave here Take a look at how they're uh, looking to get these grant funds that are out there and how they're going to be spending the money uh, because uh, you have the flexibility to be able to use them on things that are going to help short term but more importantly long term uh, to make your facility healthier and the air quality much better. Uh, another thing I'll mention too just as a side note as you're thinking about this if you're a smaller smaller district you may not be aware of this but we've had these questions from school districts um, recently is uh, the flexibility in the in the stimulus funds from the CARES Act do not require even distribution across all the schools. So you may have certain schools that are older that need more attention for things like this. So that, that's an important note that, again, you challenge your administrators to look at that you uh, do not necessarily have to use the even amount of funds for each individual school. You can spend 
uh, more of the funds on one or two particular schools that may need more uh, more attention. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention, Troy, we didn't get a chance to cover it today, but should you have any elevators um, on your on your district campus, um, take a look at our, at our some of our solutions for uh, ionization within elevators as well. So that's all, that's all I wanted to cover, Troy, but great job today, Troy, on your end as well. Thank you. I, I certainly appreciate that, Frank. And with that, we thank everyone for hanging around. We were, we're open for questions. We're always open for questions uh, via email or if you want to pick up the phone and call us. Uh, like I said, we've had about five or six questions that I've, I've answered in the open on our questions tab if you want to go take a look at them. And uh, to sort of sum those up uh, is, yes, we can go all over the country. Uh, in fact, we've done some jobs internationally as far as Saudi Arabia, uh, and then more locally in Puerto Rico, but we certainly can service California, New York. Uh, those were two questions. Uh, you know, I do think that because we're a data-driven company, Rose, that I think that is, is what you need. That's sort of the key to getting buy-in from your administration is to be able to not just say, well, everyone else is doing it, or we heard this bipolar stuff works, but is to actually have the data to present to them and to back it up. And you'll get that out of an HVAC hygiene assessment, a building health check. Uh, if, if you need to have uh, our laboratory director jump on a call with any of your administrators or your, or your purchasers, uh, he'd be happy to discuss uh, a little bit about this testing chamber and the kind of products that we've run through it and, and to talk about uh, the efficacy of some of these things. So, uh, and, and with that, I, I also uh, extend uh, the invitation that this exact presentation, uh, Frank, myself, uh, any one of our other representatives would be happy to do customized for your school. If you wanted to book, you know, a, a private uh, workshop or a conference call, a virtual meeting, we'd be happy to come in and uh, take you through this uh, presentation or one that would be customized to your school's needs. Uh, of course, yes, we do environmental coronavirus testing. Uh, we have a do-it-yourself test kit option that we can send you that gives you the full power of our laboratory. You would be the one collecting samples. That's pretty easy to use. And then uh, you could have us come out and do it as part of that larger uh, investigation. And then, yes, Robert, that before and after of the fan wall, uh, the retrofit uh, under the HVAC New Life Restoration Program, that was the same unit. And so as uh, I answered, uh, in the uh, open question chat, uh, I can send you uh, an email with a link to the actual step-by-step -step video that, that uh, archived that process. You can see that old blower getting ripped out and everything taken down to the metal and the wall coming back in. And we also have a flat that can uh, do that too. So um, again, uh, with regards to the CARES Act funding, uh, cooperative purchasing, and then yes, we, we do have financing available uh, to be able to do some of this. As Frank mentioned, uh, some of this CARES money is not getting distributed evenly. Uh, so there are options as uh, with this capital expenditure equipment uh, and the recapitalization of equipment via HVAC New Life, uh, we can offer you guys some financing uh, to ease this process along and create a healthy school building for your folks. So uh, again, with that, I know we ran a little bit over, but we started a little bit late. Uh, but I'd just like to thank all of you guys for hanging around. And uh, you know, we'll see you next time. On behalf of me and Frank and Pure Air Control Services, uh, we're here for you. We're here for your schools. And thank you for attending. <laughs>